Well, what is up, Substance? Make some noise wherever you are at. Come on. Hey, if we hadn't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Nate, and I serve as one of the pastors here. And on behalf of Pastor Peter and Carolyn House, we're so excited to have the Haas family with us. So really quick, here's what, here's what we're doing tonight. We, we thought going into, just God is doing crazy things at our church right now. And many times as a leadership team here, we know that, that that's happening, but it's really hard for us to let you all know all the time because we're still doing those things. And so what I thought would be an amazing idea is what if I took all of you to dinner with the Hosses? Would that be fun tonight? And so if you could go ahead and bring out the pizzas, we're going to just enjoy it. There's no pizzas, but uh, I, I thought we'd get the, the whole family up here and we're going to just let you know who they are. Maybe some of you have never met them before, but uh, Pastor Peter, could you actually introduce your family to us? All right. We, we honestly thought for a second we were going to get all sorts of McDonald's, but then, uh, and we'd all eat in front of you guys. And then we realized that my son would probably freak all you out, so... <laughs> With his, but no, we love to pick on him. Once you know our family, we love to, and he's a good, you're a good sport, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. No. Okay. So let me start out with my youngest. This is my son, Eden. He's 14 years old. And, uh. And let me just say, Eden's team in Substance Youth just won the big prize, oh, yeah. Mall of America. So. Let's go. Yep. Come on. Okay, so he's our youngest. My middle daughter, who is 17, her name is True, like true and false. And so she's a junior in high school. And of course, my oldest daughter in college is, she is, she is back from Florida where she goes to college just for spring break. Spring break at Subsurance. It just doesn't sound as cool. Uh, you know, it's like reverse spring break. Anyway, Elijah is freshman at college. And of course, you guys know um, my leading lady. Who I, I married this lady, just so you know. I married her 24 years ago. And uh, best decision I ever made. I didn't fully comprehend how good of a decision it was until just recently even. So I love you. <laughs> I love, I love you. So anyway, All right, well, and, and let me introduce right here, our executive pastor right here at Substance Church, Nathan Puccini. No, but okay, okay, just so everybody knows, uh, Nate's sitting at the table tonight and he's very much family. In fact, he lives by us. We can ride bikes to each other's houses. We do all the time. And we do, we do. And uh, no, but seriously, uh, Nate, I love you, man. It, it's really been fun to do life with you. And, and of course, you've really revolutionized our staff. Um, many of you guys know um, Pastor Nate was actually one of our trustees before um, coming on staff at Substance. He, he had over 200 employees and 16 cell phone stores. And he was just this young entrepreneur. And I, like, I was like, if anybody can figure out multi-site church, it's this guy. And he's like a third-generation pastor's kid. And so he took the big step. Yeah, I know. Come on, PKs. At least three of them in the audience. Okay, so. I, hey, I love pastor's kids, by the way. Because if you can grow up in church and not hate it. I'm just saying that's a gift, okay? Because because church people, let's just say sheep bite, okay? And so uh, if you can grow up and maintain your innocence and love for the body of Christ, it's awesome. So anyway, give it up for Pastor Nate. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So I just really thought it'd be a great idea if you could get to know the family even better. I, I love Pastor Peter and Carolyn Haas. I, really, I, I tell people, if you ask me what my job is, I, I'm just called to steward their vision. That, that is it. That is as far as it goes for me. And I'm telling you what, it is a vision worth stewarding. It's a, it's a very, this is a very honorable family. And I, I honestly, I do have a front row seat to their life. And, uh, and, and I don't say, I don't care if I'm paid or not or work here or not. This is my church home, no matter what, because God has called us to, to honor the vision that, that he's given Pastor Peter and Carolyn for this church is so big. There is room, and I know their heart, there's room for every single one of you in the vision. Is that cool? I think, I think it's pretty awesome. Uh, but I've also had this front row seat for the last almost 11 years now. I was thinking back about your family. I just love your, I actually love you guys so much. Like, I, I'm really good friends with your, your daughters and, and Eden and I hang out in church sometimes. And, uh, 
And I just remember this, I had this vivid uh, picture of many years ago at the operation center. Anybody remember the operation center? It's good. Sometimes we drive by it. We miss it. It's like driving by this old home that we used to live in. But I, I just remember every summer in June, you would come into this, this, they had this just nasty old minivan. And, and, and if you get to know them, they're very frugal people, actually, um, unless it comes to fashion. And then they're frugal in every other area. And, but... Uh, but they, every year they would take a family vacation together and you would pull into the church parking lot there and your kids, you, you were so cute back then and Eden had big chubby cheeks. And, and so you would stand at the car and our staff would pray over you and we'd send you out on these road trips. And you actually did road trips every single year as a family. I just like, I didn't understand because honestly, Substance is kind of a big church. It's a, it's a very large multi-site church, a lot happening. And I'm seeing this family, the leaders of our church in this old nasty minivan with crushed Cheerios down in the chairs. And, and uh, you know, it would break down as part of the tradition on the trip and those kind of things. And we would pray over you and send you out. And I, I just, that's a memory that was sealed in my heart. And I really felt God said, you're not just called to a leader, you're called to the family of a leader. Yeah. And it's really important to understand that. It's really important as I understand who you two are, it's actually about the legacy that you're leaving in your kids and how diligent and faithful you are in raising them up. And I just want to talk actually to them a little bit, if that's okay. We yeah. hear from you all the time. And so, which is great. It's great. Um, feel free to pipe in if you want. You're my boss. But uh, I wanted to start with uh, Elijah at the end here. She left us. I was so sad. She left us just a little bit ago to go off to college because she has to get educated and all those things. Uh, but could you, you left back in the fall. Could you give an update on your life? What's happening? What's the story? Why did you leave us? All those things. Um, so I'm actually going to school in Lakeland, Florida, which is like by Tampa and Orlando. So it's nice and sunny. There's palm trees. It's amazing. Um, I'm going to Southeastern University and I'm studying um, music business and graphic design. And I'm really involved with their worship there. So it's been really fun. I've been loving it. Yeah. In fact, if you, if you guys haven't listened to SCU worship, um, some of the best worship in the United States is coming out of that university. And so I, I just encourage you, if you guys want extra good worship and you're just, you don't know where to find it, literally, I, we were all laughing because Justin Bieber's wife just tweeted you guys or posted whatever it is now, Instagram. <laughs> And I, I actually have a, a little uh, confrontation for you, Elijah. Uh, you were supposed to come back and work for me this summer, but I hear rumors that you may be touring with SEU Worship. Is that really a thing? Yeah. You, you actually probably should call me and explain that before you take uh, parents to give me a hard time. We, we'll let you go tour with SEU Worship this summer. But hey, I just wanted to get into something. I, I was able to watch your life as you were involved here at Substance. You, you, you helped serve in many areas and you always sat on the front row with us and it was such a great time. But now that you've, you, you went to a Christian school and an amazing experience there, then you, you had even a lot of friends that left to go off to college. Many went to Christian colleges. But you're seeing many students not really thriving in college. What, what would you tell parents and students in this room how to prepare to thrive in college specifically? Yeah, I guess the biggest thing that I would tell anyone who's like kids are prepping or just anyone who's prepping to go to college, I think I would say like make the decision in your mind beforehand that you're going to like prioritize your faith after you move away. I think it's really easy to like assume that you will prioritize it, but you know, when you're there and you've had an insane week and a crazy weekend and you have a lot of homework, like you're not going to feel like going to church the next day. You're not going to feel like searching for some place that you like want to go to church it's going to be so much easier to like want to podcast something or just like live stream church from home but like the problem with that is that you're not actually getting in a like a life-giving community where you're surrounded by other people and you're not putting yourself in an environment where you're going to regularly be able to discern like God's will for your life and it's such a like it's it's such a hard time like this is the time of your life where you're making major life decisions about your career and about like where you're going to go a lot of financial decisions like some people are even like finding their spouse like those are like major things that you want God to like pour into and I just feel like if you're not regularly putting yourself in an environment where you're going to be like hearing from God and like experiencing him then like who's going to stop you from spending a hundred thousand on a degree that like you're not passionate about or marrying someone who's crazy you know like <laughs> it's true it's so true. preach preach 
You know, and that's that's one of the reasons why I chose. <laughs> That's one of the reasons why I chose to go to the school that I'm at right now is because I knew I was going to be in an environment where I would be able to hear from God and discern his will for my life. And another reason why I chose to go there is because I knew that there were tons of life-giving churches like within eight minutes of my school. Like I knew there were places I could get involved. And it's actually been so cool because the church I've been going to since I moved there, they're amazing. They're Hillsong affiliated. The pastors are incredible. And I've gotten to go through their growth track and now I'm serving on their worship team. But, and they bring in all the same guest pastors as like Substance do. It's like seeing all my parents' friends. It's amazing. <laughs> but um, it just, it feels so much like home. But I've been so surprised like how many people like I go to school with just have not been prioritizing going to church. And it's just like kind of been like just not a priority for them and they haven't been finding that community. So I guess I would just say my number one advice would be that like when you're choosing a college or choosing like where you're gonna go next, you should also be like searching for churches as well. Um, Cause it's like, you can't really go four years of your life without being in church, without kind of dealing with some consequences. Like it's a big deal. Like you may find a school with like a really good program, um, but if the environment is oppressive spiritually and like there isn't like a life-giving church around there, like I think it's gonna be a lot harder for you. And at the end of the day, God's gonna be able to open way more doors for you than any degree program could. I know who's preaching on Sunday. Let's go, you got a pastor there, come on. I mean, go ahead, Pastor. I was just gonna say, as a mom, I've been so proud of her because so many Sundays, she will ask so many of her friends to go to church and they'll all cancel on her at one in the morning or at six in the morning, she'll get a text and she will go by herself. And I just think, I'm just so proud of that discipline because we're not there making her go to church. And so, good job, Elijah. <laughs> good job, Elijah. And uh, is it true that you did not go hear your dad preach at a church because you needed to go through the growth track at your church? Yeah. Possibly. It was a far drive. Go through your growth. Go through the growth track. See, you can go to growth track. You can go to growth track. Who's going to growth track? I was literally <laughs> preaching in Florida, and I thought, you know what? Wouldn't it be great to have my daughter in Florida co come and show me some love? And she's like, Dad, I can't. I got to go through the growth track at my church. <laughs> come on. Okay, well, and there's some other things happening. I, uh, I was. I'm sorry, so sorry, so sorry. I, uh, uh, Elijah, a lot of people don't know that, that your dad passed down the skills to pay the bills to you, uh, specifically in DJing, and you've actually had some crazy opportunities. I know that you DJed uh, at one of the largest youth conferences in Europe uh, just in the last couple years. You've actually been in some of the largest churches in all of North America using your skills uh, for the kingdom. I, I'm really curious about this. It's so interesting in our world what's happening, uh, specifically with music, but could you actually share with us, I think that, we, would you love to hear like what's actually happening in the body of Christ? I, I want I want you to know your generation is truly the hope of the world. Uh, every other generation, it's tough. Like millennials, sorry, you're tough. Gen Xers, you did nothing. Baby boomers, you're retired. It's really these, am I right? Like, come on, Gen, Gen I love you, but it's true. I'm right in between Gen X and, anyway. So, uh, Elijah, you're, you're the hope of the, you're, you're our hope. Um, you're our only hope. But could you tell me a little bit about what, like tell me what's happening in the body of Christ. I wanna hear what's happening. I think you have a unique insight on this that you can share with us. Yeah, so I, I feel like what's happening, like even at Substance is like, it's really rare. Like just um, even that I was able to learn how to DJ here, like that I was 15 years old and that I was able to have first on like hand experience, like out in the foyer. It was like the first ministry that I really got to take ownership of, which was really, it was just an overall amazing experience for me. And it's even more fun now that I get to do it like all over the world and London and Canada. I don't know. It's, no big deal. It's been so She's much an fun. international DJ over here. No big deal. <laughs> but um, I feel like churches are just starting to wake up to the idea that they're a little like not as in touch with culture as they thought. I think they're starting to see that like contemporary Christian music isn't as contemporary as it maybe used to be. I think a lot of <laughs> a lot of the genres that we see like dominating the charts right now are just not what we are seeing represented in churches. We're not seeing as much 
uh, rap or gospel or electronic dance music or electronic pop. Like, you, it's just not being represented in the church, but that's, like, what is, like, happening culturally right now. And I think one of the reasons why I'm getting a lot of opportunities to DJ at different places is because churches are realizing there is a need for a church to be culturally relevant. There is a need to reach the next generation, but they're having trouble doing that. And so I feel like I've been really blessed to, like, be a part of, like, getting to do that. It's been so fun for me to be a part of this, like, ministry and go to these places. It's It really is an evangelistic and it just shows, like, why it's important, like, why, like, variant is such a need. Like, it's, I don't know, it's really cool for me to be able to, like, play a Drake song and, like, connect people to Jesus. Like, yeah. I feel like it just opens up people's, like, hearts and minds in, like, a really unique way that it's, like, the church hasn't really been getting to do as much recently. So in fact, Lige and I were just in Victoria, British Columbia, and I was doing a women's conference and I preached their weekend services and then she was DJing one of the after parties. And it was so fun. If you could have seen these, these teenagers and young adults DJing, like Lija DJing, she's so connected with them. The atmosphere literally shifted. And as a preacher, as someone who was sharing my story, sharing what God has done in my life, sharing scriptures, I actually wish I could have preached after the DJ set instead of before, because I literally saw what the connection and what the music did and how much it shifted the atmosphere. And I'm like, ah, oh, now I wanna preach. And, and instead it was the end of the night, but she killed it, man, it was awesome. Come on, Elijah. And I just want to say this. I really felt like I'm supposed to say this to you. Um, thank you. Thank you for your discipline because I watched you in school have to be so diligent and faithful with homework. And you just, you graduated with honors and you're really smart, but you actually were always faithful to church when you're here. And then staying faithful where you're at, you're very honorable. And we just thank you for being a model. I really sense the Lord is saying that you are modeling and demonstrating as a forerunner of what it means to to actually bring relevancy to the, to the church because the kingdom is always relevant yeah. and you have to know that. So thank you for doing it. Can we honor Elijah? Come on. You're awesome. And I miss you. You can come back at some point. Are you going to come back at all? Like, I mean, just yeah. not just visits. You're going to work here, right? Like someday we got you. We got you. We're going to lock it in now. You're going to sign a contract. We got you. Okay, good. Um, all right, I'm going to go to my friend Eden over here. Give it up for Eden. Okay, you can use that right there. You can use the mic, my friend. But I, 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 uh, right. I get to spend a lot of time with Eden. We actually, uh, before I went to the West Side campus, we'd sit in the front row together quite a bit, wouldn't we? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> I'd wake you up a few times, wouldn't I? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, in fact, you usually tend to fall asleep when your dad's preaching, I noticed. Guest speakers, you're really engaged. You're amening them. You're <laughs> shouting them down. Love and worship. Your dad gets up to preach and you're just like snoring away. And then I send our youth pastor pictures to provide accountability. Could we talk about, does this happen at like home? Like at dinner, do you fall asleep as well? Like how does that work? What? Do you give me an answer? Nothing? Okay, let's move on. All right. Hey, sure. Uh, we actually, we have uh, some, some really close friends of Pastor Peter and Carolyn that are coming in, Benny and Wendy Perez, and they pastor an amazing church out in Las Vegas, and you had a chance to go there. Uh, the Church LV, awesome church, very much like substance with the Latino flair to it, and uh, you're really close to them, but I, you got to go, and I heard this story about you getting to go ex experience their church. Can you tell me, like, what actually impacted you? Um, well, Nate, um... <laughs> When I went there for the first time, I didn't really know what to expect. I didn't really know what the um the like what the kids think was gonna be like. And right when I entered, it was like this awesome charades. They were just kind of just playing like it was like an awesome game, like it was the funnest thing you could ever do. And it was so shocked that I've never experienced any church like this. And it really made me think like how substance, maybe how can that be better or even more fun? Come on, is that good? That's great perspective. And, and so then after that, I believe something changed and you began serving in our kids ministry, right? So you're in youth now, but you began serving and it's just been so fun. Like I, I've had this front row seat of seeing you be this cute little kid with chubby cheeks and then your voice got deeper like a month ago <laughs> and you keep getting taller. And when you laugh, it's kind of like really deep, right? Something's changing, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so... Uh, 
But I actually just says, as a, a personally as a parent, you you help in kids ministry, and you're kind of like the human jungle gym back there serving those kids. Yeah. And I I watch you. Here's what happens with Eden. He shows up early. He puts on his kid's apron, right? And then you go back. You serve. And then he comes into the the room back, Pastor Carolyn's office. He gets changed, does his hair, maybe does some yeah. deodorant. <laughs> Sometimes you don't do your hair. And then uh, and then you get prepped, and you come to the next service, right? And, and so just tell me, what is it like every week? Why do you do that? Like, what's serving do for you? Well, I do know that there are just, like, sometimes for, like, those kids who just come in, they're very nervous. They just don't, like, they don't know, like, they're shy. They want to stay with their parents. Yeah. And that's when the parents, is like, they want to have a time where they can, they can just, like, just sit in church and they can just relax yeah. and just enjoy the sermon without their kids being, like, maybe just crying or etc. like that. So... When they see like maybe someone with like a familiar face, they'll feel happy and they'll just be able to enjoy their time and the kids so that like in the, in the kids area and, and it just be peaceful for everyone and everything will be happy. Yeah, that's good. Is it, come on, give it up for Eden. We're so proud of you, Eden. So proud of you. And so I, I, I know that you have a lot going on in life. Sometimes you're tired. You guys have so much homework at school. and you, do. You, yeah. <laughs> so you come in on Sunday. You come in super early, and then you serve. Like, can you tell me, like, I know you have things you go through life. You have problems, things you're dealing with. But, like, what have you experienced serving now? You've kind of been serving well, for quite I've a while. Learned, yeah. Well, now that I've learned that, that your purpose is bigger than your problems. That's good, man. Come on. Does that minister to you? Oh, hey, we well, thank you. We're so proud of you to serve. Like the greatest thing is we so preach, attend to service, service, service here. And I was just so cool to see you go from kids ministry to, to immediately getting involved in serving. I've seen God really do something different in your life as you get older. And I, I actually think it has to do because you actually choose to serve. I think it's because you choose to show up and minister to other people that what happens in a church service, I see you worshiping. I see you, you actually do listen to your dad. Mainly, um, sometimes, maybe some, more to your mom, but uh, or not. It, oh. who, who knows? Who knows? <laughs> I don't know. I'm not getting into this. But can we give it up for Eden? Come on, buddy, you're awesome. And and God gave me a word for you early tonight, and I, I shared it in our prayer meeting. But uh, that He's given you a fearless spirit. And that because you do not fear that you're going to always walk in boldness and the boldness that you walk in is going to be your freedom and you're going to teach other people how to be fearless in God. Okay, so just know there's a strong, strong leadership gift on your life. You got to hear that. Can we give it up one more time for Eden? Hey. Come on, man. All right, and we're, we're going to now go to my favorite Haas child that has the name True. And, oh, uh, you are one of my favorites. And so... Uh, it's true. I, I got a couple of fun questions for you because I you you're you were very similar actually. We're both kind of introverted and mm -hmm. a lot of introverts at the table here. We got these two extroverts on the end. We put the introverts in the middle to just make us feel secure here. Um, <laughs> but uh, one of the things that is one of the first stories that happened when you were ten years old at Substance is yeah, it's on. It's good. So we, one of the first things that happened here at Substance is we we know this story about downtown historic Wesley. And specifically, I've heard your dad preach that sermon about four million times as I've traveled with him. And guess what? I've preached it like four million times. Your mom's preached this sermon because it was a true miracle that we saw take place in our church. And, and that maybe not all of you know the story, but uh, we, uh, True, when she was 10 years old, had asked God to reveal himself uh, to her and speak to her about what God had for substance buildings. And, and it happened. God, God actually gave you a very, very specific uh, word and vision. And, and I, I'm really curious because I've had the privilege of sharing that story. And, and I know it sometimes it's maybe kind of hard being you because you're like the girl that hears from God and you're the DJ. Um, I believe you hear from God, Elijah. You and I believe God you, too. DJ. We love it you. It goes both ways. And so, but... Um, and you can learn how to DJ. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you don't that's have right. to. 
could be on the DJ. Everybody team. always confuses her. Yes. Confuses this is these true. Two. Uh, yeah. And yeah. so I, I just want to know, like, how did that whole process feel like? You you were very young when when that happened, and there was such a, a just a beautiful innocence in that story. And now I've watched you grow up. It's several years later. The miracle came true. We got the building. It all happened. It was covered in red and all the things. But and many of you don't know, we own a building in downtown historic. It's called Historic Wesley in downtown Minneapolis. 120 seven-year-old facility now, and God gave True a vision of the actual building. Do we have a picture of it? Uh, probably. Uh, just uh, real, real quick, real quick, the, the recap was True came up to me when she was 10, and she said, Dad, by this time next Thursday, you're going to find a building that Substance is going to get, and it has a balcony. It's covered in red, and when you look up, you'll say, wow. And a couple days later, I happened to walk into Historic Wesley in downtown Minneapolis, and I looked up and I said, wow, and then I freaked out. And I'm like, oh my gosh, my daughter told me this was going to happen by this Thursday. And so sure enough, we ended up uh, moving on it, and, and now we own it. And it's kind of a crazy little miracle story. Yeah, so. and, and True drew a picture that matched the auditorium, even just to just give her dad something to just continue to stoke his faith. But I just want to know, what has that done for you? What has God done in your faith and how you trust in God and believe in God? Just share with us a little bit. We all want to hear, right? We kind of hear about the story. Right, okay. So even looking back now, it's so strange how specific God was. And I know that, like, if God would have told me that today, I would have totally overanalyzed that, as weird as that sounds. Even the phrase, when you look up, you're going to say, wow, that doesn't even, like, make sense. Why would I want to embarrass myself, claim that I heard from God when I didn't? But, like, as a 10-year-old, I didn't know enough to even question it. So, but, like, as I get older, the prophetic has become harder for me. And as an adult, I'm constantly tempted to second-guess the impressions God puts on my heart. And it's easy to become paralyzed by asking the question, is that really you, God? Right. And it's easy to right. lose our childlike faith. But Proverbs 3, 5 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. But adults have a lot more understanding than children do. So it's really hard to not lean on that knowledge. Right, right, <laughs> right. Let's go. No, that's good. Let's go. It's true. Yeah. Come on. It's true. That's the word. So. Do you still, you have any other, impre any buildings, anything in the future get thing? Not on demand. No. Not on demand. We can't just make one happen. No. It actually has been really beautiful to watch. Uh, one thing that I love about you, True, is you honestly are a true worshiper. One, I see you coming to these environments, and I've actually even heard from your parents, like, you intercede, you you get before God, you, you're leading Bible studies, you're you're. You're kind of a go-getter when it comes to your faith. The one thing, I mean, your name is really who you are. Maybe we could work on the grace, but you are true. Yeah. You are. I'm joking. Oh, I'm, just, I'm, just joking. I'm joking. Yeah. You're awesome. But just so you guys I, know, true is our feisty one. When she shares her opinion, everybody knows. Let's just say. Let's just say everybody knows. Okay, so I think you're 17 now. You're no longer that 10-year-old. And there's a lot of young people in the room. Make some noise if you're young. Really? All right. So, but, I, and just being a pastor's kid myself, growing up in the church, now you're a teenager, you have all the pressures of school, anxieties, those normal things that, that happen. I know growing up as a pastor's kid, many times it can feel like that you're just, I, I know many times even myself, it feels like just everyone's looking at you all the time. It feels like they're judging you, they're judging your motives, who you are. You can't make mistakes because your dad's the pastor. You really grow up in a glass house where, um, and, and honestly, in a lot of ways, it's kind of an unfair judgment of your journey of, of pursuing God. But I've also watched you lean into that. And there's some specific things that you've done in your life that are so mature at your age. And I believe your parents have really helped you with that. But could you just let us know, how do you still connect with God? Right. Well, I think everyone has to learn how they connect with God. And I've been so blessed to have parents that can help me learn how to do that. But I think you have to be super intentional. Like that was the key for me. I had to have friends keep me accountable. You know, the Bible app street keeps me accountable. Yeah. You know, um, <laughs> yeah. Bible studies every week with your friends. Then it just becomes fun at that point. And I also see like a Christian counselor, which is so helpful. Even if you don't think you need one, it's still like worth everything. You know, Mrs. VR, if you're out there, I love you. <laughs> and everything. <laughs> Yeah, so I think there's a lot of distractions when you're a teenager, 
And so you just have to find and um, be intentional about finding your worship time and prayer time. If I feel like that day is super busy, I'll be playing the audio while I'm brushing my teeth in the morning, just making sure you get your daily dose in. I heard it this morning. <laughs> oh, really? When I was trying to sleep, but... Yeah. I mean, do, you, do you literally have the Bible pl playing out loud? Yeah. Okay. Do you read your Bible? <laughs> do you read your Bible? Ouch. I'm kind of forced to because <laughs> you play it so loud. It wakes me up. I was like, oh my gosh, I couldn't fall back asleep. It was like, and, and is it like a British accent that reads it? Uh, well, a little bit. <laughs> Like, who is reading the Bible to my She's family? She's doing the Nikki Gumbel Bible in a year app with a whole bunch of her friends. So, yes, it's got some British in there. That's beautiful. Come on. <laughs> hey, I, I really, when I think of you, I don't think vulnerable. I want you to hear that. I think extremely stable. The, the Lord is giving you a stable spirit. It's consistent, and, it, and the stability is integrity. And the Lord says there's an integrity that exists in you that will actually allow you to go the long haul. In leadership, in ministry, there's a strong leadership calling upon your life. There's, there's stability. And, and I even sense the Lord wanting to confirm that in your life. The stability will be your strength. Not vulnerability. The stability will be your strength. And be vulnerable with the Lord. He really wanted me to say that to you. Could we give it up for true? Thank you. You did it, the Haas kids did it. You, they, we just give it up for all of the Haas kids. We're gonna dismiss you. We're gonna go ahead and dismiss them at this time. You may leave the stage. I, I love you guys, thank you so much. We'll do more of this, right? You guys want more of this with them in the future? That'd be so good. We're gonna kind of just adjust a little bit here and I'm gonna get in with Pastor Peter and Carolyn. And we're, if you're cool, we're gonna go a little long with this tonight. You guys enjoying this? I, I just love this inside. I, I was actually, when we kind of got came up with this idea, I think this is so brilliant because so many times we hear Pastor Peter preach, we hear Pastor Carolyn preach, but, but there's a depth in which that preaching comes from. And there's an integrity in which that preaching comes from. And I, I just think it's important to dig some, mine some of that stuff out, what's happening in church. And, and I, I watch your family. Uh, for me, it's such an honor to, uh, to have uh, people that are years ahead of me as, as mentors of mine accountability to me that just watch your life because um, I know that my kids Noah and Addison are going to have a much better experience because I had people before me model health and longevity and fruitfulness and just seeing your kids they're all leaders right come on those children are just amazing men and women of God and it's fun to see you build that into them but could we talk a little bit about how you've raised your kids to love the church we see that they just love the church that's that's one thing that we see and there's a ton of external pressures I've watched you actually navigate those at times could you could we just unpack that a little bit as as we talk about parenting specifically uh, tonight, could you share a little bit with me? Yeah, so I, one of the things that Peter and I love to do with our kids is um, constantly cast vision. So I, I cast vision for every Sunday, every Wednesday, every Saturday night, every Tuesday. I mean, like anytime we're gonna be in church, I'm casting vision for why we're going, um, that we're not just going through the motions of a church service, but that what happens when we gather together and, and just the corporate presence of God and the miracles. So then I'm casting vision for all the miracles, all all the answered prayers, and then all the people that we get to connect with. And so we're always praying for um, amazing conversations with people that, that are just a God conversation. And so that's one of the things that we do. Um, but but we, don't, we don't come to church for us. I, I, I hope you guys get this because um, when you come to church with a consumer mindset, you will only get so much from God. Why? Because there's more blessing in giving than there is in receiving. And so it's more about even talking to our kids about all the people we get to serve when we show up. Okay, so because people ask, you know, I, I don't come to hear a sermon. I come to give the sermon I got in my quiet time. You know what I'm saying? Like, and so the entire orientation of our family is is kind of built that way that we're, we're, we, we have a purpose that's bigger than our problems, like my son said. It's just bigger than we, we, and it's actually more fulfilling to do that because we can be a part of a person's testimony every single Sunday. And so it's, it's more about 
you know, like talking to our kids, hey, these are the conversations that you can have. Eden, these are the, the parents that you can impact by watching their kids and, and things like that. So Yeah, and I think one of the myths of that, that people struggle with when it comes to church is, let me just talk about school for a second. Like, I don't know about you, but my kids complain about going to school kind of like every day of their life. And I finally had to just say, stop. Like, it's the law. Like, you have to go to school. So, like, I don't want to hear, like, complaining about it isn't, it's actually draining your energy. It's not actually helping you. You know, but, but when it comes to church, it's not the law, right? You, you don't have to, you're not required to go to church legally. And so I think as parents, we, we freak out and we expect our children to have the emotions of loving God and loving church at all times and in every way. And so then if they don't want to go to church, we, it messes with us. And then we're so afraid that, that that's going to dictate their life that then we're, we listen to our kids' emotions and feelings and, oh yeah, you don't have to go to church. And, and so we've just made a rule, like we don't ask ourselves if we want to go to church, we go to church. And it's not because we're pastors, it's because we're hosses and we love Jesus. And so we know that Psalm 92 says, planted in the house of the Lord, you will flourish. Not isolated at home alone, you will flourish. Planted in the house of the Lord, you will flourish. Hebrews says, don't get out of the habit of meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Some are in the habit of not meeting together. It's easy to get out of the habit. So we just make it a habit of this is what we do, whether we feel like it or not. And then, and I know that sounds legalistic. It's not, it's not meant to be legalistic. It's meant to be, if I listen to my emotions and my feelings, feelings every day. I would eat every food on the planet and I would sleep 12, 13 hours a day and I would watch nine hours of Netflix because that's what I feel like doing. Are you hearing me? So we have to be really careful with our feelings. I feel like we're this buffet and this menu and like, well, you know, no, you you can't ask yourself, do you feel like going to work? You go to work, you know? And so I think as parents, we're so freaked about our kids hating church that we listen, we let their emotions rule. And it's same with dropping your kids off at kids ministry. Can I just give you a, a quick little mom tip if you got little kids? You practice in the car. I would practice at home and I would practice in the car. This is how I'm gonna drop you off at church. And this is what you're gonna do at church. And this is gonna be your response when I drop you off at church. And we're gonna Thank practice you, mom. it. Love yes. you, so, see I mean, you later. Practice it. You don't just happy drop heart. them off in kids ministry and expect them to be happy. And, and, and let me just say this. Your kids are never going to say, Mom and Dad, you spent so much time with me. You need to go have a date right now. Okay, they're never going to say that. Your kids are never going to say, go have a vacation without us. We're good. Like, they're never going to say that. But if you truly care about your children, and you're actually going to then prioritize your marriage, which means you're actually going to go on date nights, and you're actually going to go on vacations without your kids. And so you can't listen to your kids dictate what you do with your life. And so, I mean, those are just some of the things that have helped our kids. The other thing I would quick say is we're super real. So one of my favorite things is my kids do love watching their dad preach, but you know why they do is because he's so real. He's not a fake person on stage as he is at home. And when Peter and I are cranky and when we're tired, which we are cranky and tired and we fight, we own it and we own it all the time and we apologize to our kids all the time. And, and so I think because they see, <laughs> I'll let you talk. <laughs> no, you're doing really good. It's real. <laughs> I just think they see us being real. They see us authentically love Jesus. They see that when we're stressed, we own it and we say, hey, I'm actually feeling really stressed. Would you pray for me right now? So we don't live this fake facade of we're perfect. We have it all together. We love Jesus all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Like we own what we need and we invite each other into our exhaustion, our stress, and we say, hey, I need you to pray for me right now. I'm feeling stressed. And you know, so, so I think we're real. And then the other thing I would think we do with our kids is we... We've never been legalistic when it comes to movies and music. And what we do is we never say you can't watch a rated R movie and you can't listen to this music and you can't, you can't, you can't. Here's the deal. When they're toddlers, you're much more strict with what they can do for their safety. But when you've got teenagers, you have to teach discernment. So what we would do is, hey, let's watch that TV show together and let's talk about it. How does that make us feel? Are the, the actions divorced from the consequences? In that, and, you know, you watch a 007 movie and you see him sleeping around with a bazillion women and there's no STDs and there's no pregnancies and there's no broken hearts. You know what I mean? They just act like they, they're mechanical robots. And so, um, we, you know, you, you've got it. So we watch TV shows. We watch movies. We listen to music together we we look at the artist's lifestyle we look at the lyrics and we talk about it we teach discernment because here's the deal Mu music music movies tv shows they're gonna keep changing so if as a parent or as a youth leader or as a discipler if all i do is give my kids rules 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 i'm not actually teaching them how to discern are you hearing me so like even teaching our kids how to manage their time their energy anyway i could keep going but it's good <laughs> come on 
So many, and I, what I've watched is you be very strategic and disciplined in the strategy. Um, we, well, you're a strategist by kind of nature, but just watching the strategy. I, I think back to, I, and having young kids and a lot of people, we have an unprecedented amount of young children. They're just running around like crazy. You just staff alone. There's like a million kids. Y'all have a lot of kids. And so our, our kids ministry is quadrupled in the last few years. And so you look back, reflect on that season of young children. What are some things that you maybe would change or do different or, or what happened in that season that, you know, develop the kids that we see today? Well, just unpack that a little bit for me. Uh, just for those in the room, who has a young child in this room under, say, under the age of eight? Raise your hand. There's a lot of people here in that season of life. Would you love to hear about what they did? Yeah, I was sure of that. So I, you guys have heard the story, but Lijah was so strong-willed as a little toddler that we took this test and it, like she scored so high in the test that the only hope for me as a parent was get a support group. And so, um, I'm serious. <laughs> like, uh, and so anyway, that's what we started mom's group here at Substance because of that. And it wasn't because I was a parenting expert. I know, she's, she's actually really obedient. And, and, uh, but, um, but I started a support group because, not because I was a parenting expert, but because I needed support and I needed a network of friends and I needed people that could pray with me and encourage me. And we invited seasoned moms and grandmas to come in and give us hope that we could survive past five years of age. You know what I mean? Cause we just needed encouragement. And so we would pray and we saw so many miracles in that mom's group and we'd read parenting books so we would glean wisdom. So teachability. So I'd always, every time I've met a parent that has older kids than me, I would flood them with a bazillion questions and just be like, talk to me, talk to me, tell me, how did you survive? How did you, you know, so I'm just always had a teachable spirit to learn, to learn, to learn. And I think that, and then what we would do is, and, and I need you to hear my heart with this. Like Peter's the theology reader in our family and he watches the news. And then I read parenting books. Now that does not make me the parenting expert. That doesn't make him the theology expert. We share with each other. So I had to be very careful to not shame him into why aren't you reading parenting books, Peter? Like I'm not gonna shame him. A lot of women shame their husbands because they're not reading the same books they are. Listen, you can't do that. And then the other thing you do is you, you share with each other. I see a lot of moms then dominate in the house and say, this is what we're doing with our children. And it, it totally de demasculates the husband. And so you have to literally together go, hey, I learned this, I read this. What's your thoughts? What's your experience? How are we gonna parent this child in this season, in this age? And how are we gonna do that together? And it's honoring and it's life-giving and it's alignment and it's respectful. And so we did a lot of that. And so in that, we discovered family dinners were a huge priority. We also took all of our, when you have young kids, you have to take your, take your three-year plans and turn them into 10-year plans. Because let me tell you something, your professional success is not going to be worth a hill of beans a few years down the road. Because uh, like when you talk to old people, they don't sit around and talk about all their professional successes. They talk about their kids and their grandkids. Okay, you and I need to listen to that because at the end of the day, like I, I want you guys to know, I mean, this church is cool and all, and I love what God is doing in it, but my legacy is, is right there. You know what I'm saying? And I do not, I was so glad that there, there was a lot of times where I knew the church was hurting and I needed to sow into it more, but I can't without compromising this relationship, this relationship, or my relationship with my kids. And I'm really glad that I kind of stuck to my guns and it was painful, it was painful. But you know what, now it's actually really fun to reap the dividends of, 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 of watching my kids love the Lord because now they preach to me. Let me just tell you, like, I can't tell you how many times they encourage me with a scripture verse or with a worship song. And, uh, but part of that came by saying, you know what? I'm not gonna work more than 50 hours. I am not going to have my kids be, we didn't really allow our kids to be in a whole lot of sports or in a whole lot of extracurriculars. It was pretty much no. Um, we're here to hang at night just to be with each other. And so I said no to a lot of things, which was a little weird because my life really kind of became all about family for, you know, a good decade. But now we're, we're kind of, it's shifting again and it's a season. And so if you're out there and you're, you're wondering, you have young kids and yet you're very ambitious professionally, I would just encourage you, chill 
professionally and focus on, on family first. And because there will come a season in your life where you're gonna launch those kids and you'll have plenty of time to focus on your career, okay? It's actually kind of getting that way for Carolyn and I, where we're able to say yes to a lot of international stuff and, and speaking gigs now that we didn't because you know they're they're we're starting to launch those kids and yet and, and yet the time is still, you know family, but I, I, I just, I want to encourage you with young kids, really chill and take your time. And listen, if you don't have kids, you can still practice discipleship with your roommates. And what is discipleship? It's you inviting them to do things to, into higher levels of maturity. And I don't care who you are or, or in your life, all of you can be inviting other people to higher levels of maturity. That is discipleship and parenting in a nutshell. And the more you practice it right now, the better you're gonna be at it later, amen? Come on, give it up for that. That's a good word. I think it's such an important message for our church in this current season. Now, I'm thinking about what's happening. Some of you may not know, we actually launched two campuses in the last couple, it feels crazy. Um, we launched a campus just a couple weeks ago. So we're two Sundays into that. We're, we're on the west side, give it west side, best side, let's go. So we have 705 people on the launch Sunday. Church is expanding. The church has grown by over 1,000 people in the last 13 months. Just a lot happening in substance. I just want to unpack a little bit the current strategy with the West Side. Look, what are we doing over there? We're in a high, we're in a school doing all those things. Come on. I, like, seriously, you guys, we've been talking about launching with 700. And when we did, it was like, we did it. I was like freaking out. I was like, we did it. We did it. We did it. And, and uh, I, I do like, like, well, you know, I mean, we're already talking about like, what are we going to do for a building? And what, you know, like, but hey, just so you guys know, part of the reason why we don't pull the trigger on buildings right away is because um, new churches do tend to grow fast and you don't want to lock yourself in too soon. And, and obviously, you know, I mean, I, I, I do, I do want to actually plant a, a north side, uh, like a north town type building on the west side, and it'll probably be a little bit north of maybe, uh, like, was that a central middle school was probably slightly more south than we intended to go, but, you know, a church of our size, there's only so many options, but, like, I, 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 you know, so the, the heart is to obviously get a building there as well, but, um, I, I definitely, I, I, if I could just say this to you guys real quick, um, those of you who go to downtown and north town i want to continue to encourage you to do like a troop surge if you will for west side because i like north town and downtown are going to grow no matter what with all the amenities and the i mean come on when you have a kid's playland you're going to grow either way okay but we need as many disciplers to consider just even making the west side um even their their mission trip for the next couple months, would you say? I mean, like, what, I, like, what are some like we you we all sit around and we talk about ways to to make it better. But I I I, I just I want you guys to know right now, all hands on deck with our West Side because I I really believe that um, what we're doing there it's going to turn into two thousand people very very quickly if we are vigilant in the first six months of this new spiritual baby that God has given us, okay? So just, if you're out there and you're willing to even just go for a couple months, Pastor Nate here is actually the campus pastor. And so, Come on. Um, you know. That's sad, let's go. And we, we even just brainstorming, uh, we, we're talking today, just like, what, how could we do this? Like, really the West Side's like a baby. It, it can't feed itself, it, it cries a lot, There's it can't walk yet, it doesn't know how to communicate. But what was so cool being there, it was substance, but it was because it was because the people of substance were in the room. And that's what makes substance different. I was sitting there and watching Skip and Amy Johnson, who are some of our trustees here at Substance, and they attended our service. Now they live all the way on the east side of the metro, came all the way to the, south, the west side of the metro, attended a service, and then went and served in our elementary room as leaders that Sunday. And I, I felt like there is nothing more that demonstrates being on mission. Because yep. I really feel like the West Side, what it is, is we're giving you the mission of the church right now. Our number one priority is expand the church to reach as many people as possible in our day. That's really the goal. And God has just been, been giving us grace for that. Just uh, Numbers are simply an opportunity to reach.
reach people for Jesus, to pull them into closer levels of intimacy with other people. That's all we're trying to do. Yeah. And how many places can we do that in, in our day? Is that cool? Yeah. yeah. That's why we plant churches. That's why we're on, can you tell I'm excited about this? This is why we're on the west side. This is why we're taking on the tasks of showing up on Saturday, getting up at 4.30 on Sunday, working 14-hour days, loading that campus out, putting it on a trailer, setting up, tearing down, setting up, tearing down, because we are desperate to reach people for Jesus. And But the harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. So we're praying to the Lord of the harvest to send workers yeah. to come over to serve with us, serve three next three months, next six months. Our priority focus at substance and leadership is west side. Yeah. West side. We're going to keep driving uh, north town, downtown, grow these campuses, reach people for Jesus, get them in the small groups, get them in the ministry ownership, get them through our growth track. That's what we do at Substance, right? Four to seven friends in a ministry. But we're gonna grow this west side, but we're gonna grow it through the people of Substance coming and saying, hey, this is how we clap and worship. This is how we welcome people into our, our kids' ministry. This is how we get people in the growth track. This is how we get them into a connect group. You, you hearing what I'm saying? Yeah. So here's the invitation. I want every single one of you to come visit Westside in the next six months at least two times. Yeah. Can you make a commitment? We got about a thousand people in the room. Just imagine if a thousand people said over the next six months, I'll visit at least two times. We can actually create critical mass that we can organically grow the ministries and leadership at that campus and create a thriving long-term campus on the west side to reach as many people as possible for Jesus and, and make a difference in our city. We have over 750,000 people surrounding that campus and less than 5% of those people attend church at all on a weekly basis. I mean, there's an opportunity. The harvest is plentiful but it's up to the workers to actually do the work to bring people in and help them experience Jesus. Is that cool? Four years ago, when we talked about doing this campus in downtown, it sounded impossible that we would be where we are today. And the idea that we could do most of this in cash also seemed impossible. And yet we did that, okay? I really believe that just in a couple years, we can have something just like this building on the west side, and we'll already be focusing on the next campus. Come on, somebody. Because we're not, we're not finishing. We're not, we're not settling. Um, I really believe that God wants to turn the tide here in the Twin Cities, and it's not going to happen by us being casual about it. And so just the more of you can help us be on mission. I would be there if my tech team would allow me to be there and preach from there, but I can't because we have to record our sermons here. But uh, uh, you know what I mean, okay? So uh, just join Pastor Nate and the rest of us in just troop surge, if you will, uh, because it's just gonna, it, I believe it is gonna take off. It's gonna have a life of its own very soon. And, well, it already does. You don't launch that large without having a life of its own. But I really do believe that it's gonna, it's gonna happen fast. And then we can, that, the sooner we can now move on to the next uh, campus that we're thinking of. So we're ready to announce that campus tonight? <laughs> <laughs> We're not good. Woo! No. Um, but I, I want, one at a time. One at a time. We'll slow down a little bit. I want to talk about But something. I have ideas. Yeah, Whoa. We, have, we always have ideas. So um, you have a lot of ideas. Uh, <laughs> we did well launch said. a Mexico campus in the middle of all this. Give it up for Monterey, Mexico. Oh. It, it is literally... I, I get to be at the front lines of that and hear the miracle stories that are happening every day. I mean, we have the most amazing campus pastors in the world. I'm not joking. They are, they're the most humble, teachable people. They're calling me up. They're so excited. Our people down there are so excited about what's happening here. But could you just unpack really quick what's happening with Monterey, Mexico? We just want an update on, on that. Go for it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, well, keep in mind, so what we're actually doing is, uh, so we, we technically, we readopted a church that we planted. We sent out our very own Isaac and Lindsay Cortez uh, to launch it five years ago. And they just kept calling me like, hey, we were better together. We should be a substance campus, not our own church. And, and at first I was like a little hesitant. Um, and then I was like, actually this would be perfect you and I went down and we were like what what are we doing you know like why why aren't we just doing this together and uh so we're actually helping them find a building right now and so the the day is going to come you guys have to understand how cool this thing is it's not like I know a lot of people have been to like rural Mexico and uh this is more like going to downtown Miami in the mountains okay this is more like we you know like they like it's 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 substance it's just 
in Mexico. And so like it's, it's actually really fun to go there and preach because the worship actually feels very similar to, well, it is substance. And so we, we're just, you know, so even today we were getting pictures of a, of a yeah, potential I mean, facility. And, and that's actually something to pray about. We, uh, because it's, it's, it's Mexico, we're learning just how to navigate international law and all that stuff. Nate Buss is our financial administrator. He's just crushing it. He's, 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 he's learning Spanish. He's talking to attorneys and spanning all these awesome things that he does. Uh, but t- we just actually, we're looking at a property, literally a church potentially may have a church for us. Okay, okay, okay. Well, uh, I, I can't tell you more than that, but I, I, I can tell you that it's in such a cool part of the city where there's this part of the city where the, some of the buildings are like three, 400 years old. It's like, you know, the, the old quarter. And then there's like skyscrapers, some of the largest skyscrapers in, in Central America. Uh, and, and then it, it's all right in the middle of mountains. Everywhere you look up, you just want to just praise the Lord. And how many of you could use a little mountains in your life when you live in Minnesota? You know? um, one of the things that, you know, this last summer, uh, Substance did its first kids camp, best week ever. It was epic. We had hundreds of children here, hundreds of leaders. And so we're taking that exact curriculum that we did here, translating everything into Spanish, and that this summer in July, uh, our El Conce campus is literally going to do best week ever. We're going to send on a missions team. It's going to be kids camp. Uh, so there's some really fun missions opportunities that are going to be coming that we're going to start getting you the details very soon. In the future, we're going to be having internships going both ways, schools of ministries, and like I said, we're working on buildings. So it's, it's, there's some exciting stuff happening. Yeah, so the best thing you do is keep praying for them, pre- keep praying for that campus. It's growing and expanding, and I think sometimes they're more excited about substance than we are, man. Those Mexican family there, they know what they're doing. They love it. They, they love it. That's it right. And so we want to get every single person to our Monterey campus. You guys want to go? Uh, so we're all going to go. And so, hey, I just wanted to hit a, a few more things as we kind of finish up tonight. Uh, we have a lot of partnerships, and, and I think uh, many times here in leadership, we're at the front lines of, of the largest church planning movement in the world. Pastor Carolyn serves on, on the board of, of, of probably the, the most innovative and effective uh, missions organizations in the world with some of the most uh, important, renowned people that with the gospel and the Bible, specifically working with them. It's such an honor that both of you serve leading, not just serving, but leading the charge with these organizations. But I just want to talk a little bit about those, those relationships specifically. I think it's so important that you're not just a church attender, but you understand what we're trying to accomplish in our day around the globe, because Substance really does have a global calling. And a lot has happened. Like we just celebrated over 900 churches that we've helped plant. Substance was number 15 and since then we've pr- we've planted over nine think about that think about that and of those 9000 there's at least 900 sorry i'm already expanding it let's go i'm an evangelist no i i, I uh, of those 900 there's at least 100 of them that have already crested 5000 members okay so we are a part of a movement in our time and generation. And it's, it's actually humbling. Even the three churches we helped launch this last weekend, they launched with an average of 430, four, 418 yeah, like is the conservative. But the, they broke 400. And I kept thinking, if the churches that we're launching are now launching with 400, that, that, that's the three that we just did this last weekend. Think about that. Oh. Now, a lot of these pastors are actually coming to Substance to learn the methodology, and I don't even think that you guys realize how many pastors we train here at Substance. And, and you're, if you're out there and you're like, well, what are you training them? You have to understand how archaic most church governance is all over the world. I mean, so we're we're, we're helping to redesign kind of the, the church of the next generation and, and helping these churches thrive. And so already, like this year, we're doing a conference in Ireland. We're doing one in South Africa. We're doing one in, like, um, so in, in Canada. Uh, and, and, and I want you guys to know, financially, like, our church is actually doing this. Like, I, I hope you realize where your money is actually going to because every single week we're launching a church somewhere and it's taking on a life of its own. And that's, I, I, I want you guys to understand that when you guys give money here at Substance, it's going to a legacy that you will forever remember, okay? I even think about, like, so the organization Carolyn serves on One Hope in Fort Lauderdale, people ask me why I talk about planting a church in Fort Lauderdale. It's really just to get closer to this one organization that Carolyn already helps lead. But um, th- this this organization just, they reach 
230 some kids a minute with the gospel, okay? And, and some of the most innovative things, like our, our church, our church helped pay for the Bible app for kids to be translated into several languages. And already what we have done has been downloaded by tens of millions of kids in, in what languages? Finnish? Yeah, so Substance specifically paid for Finnish and Danish. And we actually did the story of Cornelius in the Bible app for kids. So we actually funded that. But right now the Bible app for kids is over 50 languages, 35 million downloads. Listen to this, 330,000 downloads in Iraq alone. Um, they, it's, it's, and then um, 1.6 billion children have been reached through One Hope. And so it's just the craziest thing. We get to sit in these rooms and, and hear these brilliant stories and you're, you're just weeping as they're, they're ministering to children and teenagers all over the world. And I'm telling you, it's one teenager, one child that hears about Jesus. They're hearing about Jesus for the first time. They're, they're getting a God's story for the first time. They're hearing about forgiveness for the first time. We, we heard the story of this girl, Hannah, who was in, in Africa and she was mutilated. Uh, it's just horrific. Over 200 million girls are mutilated in Africa. I mean, it's just, and she'd never heard about God, had never heard about forgiveness. Heard about forgiveness, forgave her abusers. And now her entire family is following Jesus. And she flew to Florida just two weeks ago to tell us the story. And you're just like weeping as you're like, she heard the story of Jesus and his forgiveness for the first time. The first, I just think we take for granted the beauty of the, of the story of Jesus and his, his love and his forgiveness. And I just think it truly is transformative. We do not have to hold on to bitterness and abuse and rejection and have it ruin the rest of our lives. Uh, it, we can literally accept the grace and love of Jesus and then it's going to change our family and it's gonna change our children and our grandchildren, and, which changes history. And so it is just such a humbling honor to be a part of this organization and, and what God is doing for the next generation of kids digitally it's mind blowing. Like right now they're making a Bible app. They're working with you version to make a Bible app for kids for seven to 12 year olds. And so, I mean, it's just, it's stunning that we get to be a part of this, you guys. I think it's just really important that we continue. I mean, it's so exciting, by the way. It's so important to share what, what's happening at Substance. So many times we struggle as leaders to, to really see what God is doing in our day in the, in the global church movement and actually get it out and share it. But we're so thankful because of your investment. Lives are being changed everywhere. The fact that it, it, there's not a day that doesn't go by, at least in my world, where a pastor of a church of five, 10,000 is calling substance to learn from us. It's the most humbling thing, but it's also a huge responsibility for us as a church to have integrity, humility, character, and actually just to be forward thinkers about what God wants to do in our day because there is a revival taking a place around the world. And uh, I think you've said this before, but every revival has been marked and preceded by how they have prioritized church planting as yeah, part of the reason why we're so into church planning is that when you study every Christian movement in history, it always came down to how much that movement prioritized church planting, raising up leaders, coaching leaders, getting lost people saved, saved people pastored, pastor people trained, trained people sent, okay? And what we're actually trying to do here at Substance is more than just plant a church, okay? We're planting a multi-site church that raises up a, a whole new generation of pastors and sends them out. I, I hope you guys understand, um, another campus does not make me happier and another hundred people won't ever make Carolyn and I happier. Look, our souls find rest in God alone. We're happy with just our, ourselves and our family. What we, what we do really believe though is that the harvest is plentiful, that de the demand to know Christ is greater than our capacity to keep up. And if I, if, if I was to go home and be with the Lord and we did not at least as a church launch like, you know, 15 to 30 campuses in my lifetime. And then on top of that, being a part of a church planting movement. So, so just to kind of give you an idea, what, what we do actually is, is all these pastors will come to us for training and it's kind of like Shark Tank. If we really believe that these pastors meet certain criteria, then we'll actually give them upwards of 105 grand uh, to plant a church, okay? And we'll actually create their first year business plan for them, okay? And, and that's what we actually do here with our money at substance. And so when we say we, a portion of every dollar goes to a church planner, essentially what we're doing is, is we give people startup capital to plant that church 
if they will commit to doing it the way we ask them to do it. And then in turn, at the end of the first year, they'll start paying it forward into another church planter that we deem is ready to plant a church, okay? So almost every four, and, and that started out as a tiny little fund up, in, up front, but now we have over 900, actually thousands of churches that are all kind of paying into this fund that we can now choose pastors. And it got to the point where we realized we need to be spreading beyond the United States. We need to be getting this into places like China, getting this into places like Ireland, and now we're, we're working on UK, setting it up uh, in England. We're working on um, set, like creating the coalition in South Africa. So um, these guys, you're going to be flying with me to South Africa, okay? I'm not Listen asking that deal. you. He's going. I'm just letting you know. And what you, you don't know is that uh, Pastor Peter and Carolyn lead the global initiative for ARC specifically. They're the leaders that do this. And so when they leave, it's to go serve other pastors and planters. And so we as a, a church have actually prioritized structuring our church to invest in the global movement as teachers and trainers to free them up. And, and that leads into video technology, why we do church the way we do church. We're an efficient model church. We're very committed to keep our staff freed up to work on the ministry and, and, and raise up leaders. And so a lot's happening. I just wanna move the time along a little bit. It, we just wanted to give you the inside scoop on that, but specifically, I've learned that God gives grace to those who prioritize disciplines and character. Mm -hmm. And he is, he's given you guys a ton of just grace in your leadership as a church. I, I, it's so humbling to be a part of Substance and it, it's a movement that, that it, God keeps blessing. I just see it, he keeps blessing it. But I know it's because of things that you've personally prioritized in your life. You talk a lot about mentors and accountability. We talk about that, you mentor me, we have accountability with that. Um, we, we really want every single person that is in leadership with us, you have mentors in your life, you have people that can hold you accountable, you have people that you can share secrets with, those kind of things. But specifically, you and Pastor Carolyn are mentored by one of the most influential pastors in the world right now, uh, a church called Church of the Highlands, Pastor Chris Hodges, um, they had 101,000 people in attendance at Easter last year. And they're launching uh, two more campuses that I know of, four of them going permanent. They, they have over 22 locations, soon to be 23 locations. Can you just unpack the accountability mentorship relationship real quick? I think everyone would love to hear, how is our pastor held accountable specifically? Well, okay, first off, I, I want all of you to know that your pastors have pastors, okay? And I, I really believe that everybody needs a mentor. And so, actually, the pastor who planted us was Pastor Chris Hodges at the time. Um, he did not have 101,000. He had 2,000. And so, I went to him, and I'm like, hey, Pastor Chris, um, we had both, you know, we're kind of in the same flow. He actually wrote out um, the, the first check for substance uh, from another church and said, hey, Peter, I believe in you. Let's do this together. And so um, Pastor Chris and I just have, I, I, I've made a commitment that I'm going to do whatever it takes to get around him uh, on a yearly basis. So I actually fly to Alabama where he is. In fact, I just was there this last week getting mentored by him. And, and we, we have that kind of daily texting kind of thing going on. But, but whenever, just so you guys know, whenever I have a big church decision, I always go to Pastor Chris and I'm like, hey, what would you do about this type of campus? How would you do a Westside campus? And, and like almost every year we have a church that like offers themselves to us, Pastor Chris, should we take over this church or not? And then he'll help me, just coach me through it. Because how many of you know when a guy can pastor a church with 101,000 people, uh, he's figured a couple things out. You know what I'm saying? And, and so uh, my, I, one of my encouragements, even one of my rules that I do almost every single year is I always ask this, the, these these questions, what are my dreams, who is living out my dreams, and what am I doing to earn the right to be around those people? What are my dreams, who has successfully navigated my, what are my problems, who successfully navigated my problems, and what am I doing to earn the right to be around those people? And, and so Pastor Chris has always been one of those guys for me, and so like I've, I've just made a commitment in my heart, I will do whatever it takes to be around him and inconveniently apply his advice. And there's been multiple times where he was like, Peter, that's dumb, don't do that. And uh, don't expand that campus. Don't, you're you're leading your team like in a in kind of like a weirdo. Don't do that. Um, you know what I mean? Like uh, rethink this. And um, you know, like he'll he's always feeding me books and so uh, that type of thing. And, and so uh, just 
honestly, for, for us to make sure that we're not just kind of figuring this out on our own, that we have other mentors that are speaking into it. Because I think we've all been to churches that are weird and socially isolated. You know what I'm saying? Where the pastors are bitter and controlling or, you know, those types of things. And, and so I, I, I want you guys to know that part of the reason why I travel so much is not to be out there speaking at other churches. It's to actually get mentored by the right people at the right times. And, and also part of the reason why we even have a video approach to church is because uh, as our church grows, I'm actually going to be taking you guys with me through the video camera to a lot of these places. So like even like me preaching from South Africa coming up, I, I want to be able to do the same thing from Ireland. But so this, this technology that we've kind of built our church on, uh, with Substance Studios, we're actually going to be taking it to a whole new level as we move into the, the coming year. And, and and so I part of the reason why I even wanted to do like a little family room, a, a kitchen table, if you will, is because I want you guys to understand that as our church grows bigger, we also must grow smaller. And, and I, I want to welcome you into this family because there's no way we can do this without you guys. At the end of the day, I really believe that God is actually calling you to plant some of our, our greatest campuses. And you don't even know it yet. You don't even know it. And some of you are like, well, I'm not qualified maybe to be the, the campus pastor. But, hey, you are qualified to be some of the leaders in that church. You are qualified to be some of the the the, the mentors in that church. And so just I, 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 I want to kind of draft you all up into this bigger picture of what the Lord is doing here. Because once you understand how big the call of God is... It's just going to change things for all of you. I mean, this is the start of what God is doing. I actually believe that that God is, we're, our church is only 15 years old, right? Is it 15? Okay, so our church is only 15 years old. If God can do this in 15 years, do you realize what's possible in the next 15? None of this will happen if we don't devote ourselves to the Lord in moments like this, on nights like this. In fact, that's even half the purpose of First Wednesday is that we can just pray and intercede and seek God and give ourselves to the altar of God. And in fact, I don't even know how many more questions you have yet, but, but, but I, I, I wanna, I, if I could just, if I could give you this word tonight, and it's Ephesians 4.1. The, the, the things that I'm actually, that Carolyn and I, and actually even Nate have been actually, if you guys knew the opportunities that were coming to us behind the scenes, we're, we're the, the people here at this table are kind of living about two years ahead of where Substance is at right now. If you guys knew the opportunities that are coming down the pike for Substance Studios, I mean, we are going to be doing motion pictures out of this church. I was just at Pixar with with Nate two weeks ago, learning about their story process. I mean, I, I'm just, you guys, it is crazy. And, and you were at on the board with One Hope, dreaming about like what we're gonna be doing with um, the the Bible app and, and hearing, I mean, th that our money is actually causing 330,000 people in Iraq to download the Bible. Come on, you want, you, you wonder if people are serving God in Iraq? Well, listen, there are hungry people in Iraq. The day is going to come when we're going to be planting mega churches in some of the most hostile places on the earth. And how do we know that? All we have to do is look at the data from the apps that we're creating. Are you hearing me? And, and, and so it's really just going to come down to how quickly can we raise up leaders. And I, I, I want you guys to be praying for my wife and I, especially as we go into the summer, because we're actually going to be um, getting ready to unveil a whole new discipleship program right here at Substance for leaders. That if you've been here and you don't know exactly how to serve on a higher level, we're going to be unveiling some really, really fun things. I'm not ready to actually share it all with you tonight, but I, I do believe that if you guys knew about some of this stuff, you'd probably freak out. But if I could give you this one last little Bible verse, and it's this, Ephesians 4.1. I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Some of you, you don't even realize how big the call of God on your life is. You just can't even comprehend it. And yet, I really believe that God is prophetically speaking to me that, that you're in church tonight because the call on your life is too big for you to squander it. Right. And, and God wants you to devote yourself to, and, and you don't have to earn the call, okay? He, the Bible doesn't say, Ephesians 4.1, to earn a, a call on your life. 
It says, no, live a life worthy of the calling you've already received. God already preordained good works in advance for you to do, Ephesians 2.10. And and it's not a matter of whether or not he loves you. He already loves you. You can't get God to love you more chill, okay? But, But what you can do is through surrender, receive the free gift of the Holy Spirit that will build the character in you to sustain that bigger call. Because in this room tonight... There are, there, there are millionaire business owners that are yet to be. Some of you, you don't even know it. God's giving you the idea, and he might even give you that idea tonight that will result in a billion-dollar idea. I believe that there are people in this room tonight that will start some of the greatest ministries that we have ever seen on planet Earth. And I'm doing this not so that I can get a platform. I don't give a rip about this platform. I don't get a rip about another building. I'm doing this because I want to see you fulfill the call of God, come fully alive, fully alive to the call of God. But, but, but you... But these moments, church, you've got, to t- you've got to take it serious. So the Apostle Paul says, listen, as a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you, live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient Bearing with one another in love because the people in this room are going to refine your character. They're going to say different things to you that you may or may not even want to hear. Verse 3, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And so I, I don't even know what you're planning for tonight, but, but if I could just kind of just take over because it's... I'm the senior pastor here. All right, so, um, okay, okay, okay. Uh, could we do this? Could, you, could we get rid of this table? And we, where, where's the worship band? Thank you, Artem, for coming up here. Can I have the worship band come on up here? This is what I want to do. Okay, and, and I, 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 there's a moment here. There's a moment. I really feel like the Holy Spirit's moving here. Half the reason why I even wanted to do something different is because I just didn't want to just like preach. I feel like you guys hear me preach enough. What I want you guys to understand is I wanted you to hear a little bit more about like the things that our church is doing with One Hope, the things our church is doing with the Ark, this church planting organization, the things that that even like, it, it, like I wanted you to see my kids because I've already kind of pulled, I've we're, we've kind of sucked them in. I mean, the very fact that like my daughter is DJing with my wife in Canada, which I wanted to be with you guys. I felt so, it was like, you know, not that I didn't have fun here, but it was just like, oh. I love watching them do stuff like actually the people you want to know what the highlight of the last couple of years for me was it was actually lie Joey, it was watching you DJ north of London to 7,000 people and it was actually telling the story of what true and all these all these people were like you know these teen we saw two of we, we DJed for 7,000 people and then we and then I preached and then we we, we had over two 250 people gave their lives to Christ and they all just started like following like, uh, my kids and asking them questions. And I, I, it was almost kind of weird for me to watch my kids kind of step into a new level. And, uh, and then, but, but the reason why I'm saying this is because you guys are all a part of this family and the day is even going to come when, when, when all of you are going to get sucked into this. If you want, if you don't want to, you can just whatever. You know, it's not like we're a cult or anything. You can just have fun here as well and just whatever. But I, I, I just, I, I just in my heart of hearts, you know what I, I, I want? I want to be able to 100 million years from now, I want to be worshiping next to you. And I want you, I want to be able to look over at you a hundred million years from now. This sounds a little weird, but um, as it's coming out of my mouth. And uh, this is unscripted, Peter. A um, hundred million years from now, I want to look at you and I want you to look back. And, and, and I, want, I want to be able to think, hey, remember back in March 2020 when we all just got serious with God at the altar? And, and, and I want you to be able to look at me and say, thanks for inviting me to do that. And then I could be like, thanks for doing that. Wasn't it fun? Look at all these people. And sorry, the conversation's getting really weird. But I, I just, especially 100 million years in the future. But I, I just, I, I, I hope you guys understand that God has not accelerated our church for any one of us, but for his kingdom. And therefore, the more that we get in sync with heaven's priorities, there are churches all across the city that are, they couldn't be more distracted. 
and the harvest couldn't feel more distant, and they're not experiencing harvest because, because they just can't see what God is doing. And listen, all of us, what, like that could happen here. And I don't want it to happen here. And how do we avoid that happening? By getting on our knees and just saying, God, speak to me, use me, help me live a life worthy of the calling that you've given to us. And so this is what I want to do is I want to have the worship band come on up here. It's okay. Don't be shy. And, um, and we're just going to worship a little bit. And I want some of you to come to the altars and let's like, let's do business. I believe that God brought you to church to help some of you do business. And I, and I just, I, I love, like literally, every one of you guys on stage. I just, I can't wait to see the giant churches that God is going to entrust to you someday. And the same thing with all of you. I just, I can't wait to see it. And so would you guys stand up? And let's just, let's, and, 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 if, and if you're like, you know what? I need to respond to the call of God. I just need to, I, I, I need to. I need help. I just need the presence of the Lord. Just come on forward. Just come on forward. Um, and, and let's worship, okay? Holy God, I just thank you that you've provided us with this building. You provided us with downtown, which was a miracle. You provided us with a Mexico campus. You're, you provided us with a, a West Side campus. And someday you're going to provide us with East Side, South Side. You're going to provide us with campuses in different states, campuses in different nations. You're going to provide us with all sorts of interesting ministries that are going to minister to every imaginable type of person. And God, I just pray that you would help us to live a life worthy of the calling that you've given us. And Lord, whatever it is that we need to repent of, confess to uh, tonight, Lord, to another believer, that you would just help us live with clean hands and pure hearts. We don't have to pray for promotion or pray for more resources. What we need is just clean hands and pure hearts. And so, Lord, as we seek you tonight, I pray that your Holy Spirit would cleanse us from all unrighteousness and enable us to do things that we could not do on our own. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's worship him. Let's just sing out to him.